Welcome to the state management in the era of MDM. Uh, it is part of our how-to series. This session will run from 11.15 to 12 p.m. Um, and we will save questions for the end. There is a microphone right up here, so if you'd like to line up for your questions, that would be great. I'd like to uh, welcome Sergio Aviles to the, to the stage. He, he leads our uh, Philadelphia <laughs> Mac admin group. No, I don't need that, so, all right. Everybody hear me? Okay, great. Uh, welcome to state management in the era of device enrollment. Uh, uh, Sean will be happy I said that. So, uh, my name is Sergio Aviles. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm a systems engineer with the Unified Endpoint Management Team at Comcast, um, and uh, I'm going to just go through a little bit of my background here, or how I got here. Um, I was born the seventh son of a seventh son. <laughs> Gonna, um, but seriously, a um, couple things. Uh, I've been a, an Apple computer Mac user since 1985, which, uh, despite my roguish good looks, makes me an old. Um, uh, I went to University of the Arts in Philadelphia, where I majored in illustration. I uh, was a bass player in several unknown bands who you've never heard of. Um, but I do have an album on iTunes and Spotify. And if you like uh, Prague, you, know, you can uh, ask me about it later. So, um, I worked in several pre-press shops, put my time in customer service, and um, uh, went, well, I was a little bit of a manager for there, and then switched from managing people to managing devices. Um, when we started our managed services group at the Apple reseller, I was their assistant man, and then after they fired me, uh, I uh, was a contractor or consultant for a little bit, and then I was hired by Comcast. Uh, to manage their entire Mac fleet. Um, so, and that brings me here today. So, what I'm going to talk about today is uh, state management in general, what is state management, um, why it is important, something for you to think about, and uh, how state management is typically done, and what are the challenges that uh, device enrollment brings to the table, and what do we do with these challenges, and where do we go from there? So, state management is the managing a desired state of a device. And when I mean state, I'm talking about uh, your desired set of apps, configuration, files, services, and users. And state management is the maintenance of that desired state in an item potent way. Um, and I want to talk about this particular word for one second. Um, <clears throat> idempotence is, uh, if you do a Google search, this is what usually will pop up. <laughs> uh, and it is, it is funny, it's actually a very serious technical paper written by Pat Halland talking about um, how uh, you know, message delivery guarantee is important. A very dense paper, but... Um, <clears throat> Idempotence is actually not really a word. Um, as you can see, you're running on the dictionary. Um, but idempotent is, and it means relating to or being a mathematical quantity which applied to itself under a given binary operation, such as a multiplication equals itself also relating to or being an operation under which a mathematical quantity is idempotent. And in English, I translate that to being a consistent, repeatable results from a process or workflow. And I took this from the, and this quote I took from the abstraction of Pat Helen's uh, paper. Uh, it's an essential property for reliable systems. And <clears throat> some of you may know state management as uh, configuration management. Um, and uh, it's probably a more apt term when talking about client devices. Uh, I use them interchangeably, or I think of them as interchangeable. And, uh, but the configuration management really invokes to me uh, 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 the initial deployment. But uh, your mileage may vary. Um, moving on from that, um, when we're talking about states and devices, uh, like matter, devices can have different states. Uh, and I've identified a couple. You know, we have initial, current, frozen, desired, undeal, unmanaged to the state, and the one thing, like matter, it also does is that the state of the device changes. And, and 
a state management system helps you verify the current state versus the desired state and lets you control how, when, or why and the frequency of those changes. I, I put rate because uh, when they do the picture-in-picture -picture later, the frequency would have caught off. So I just changed the uh, slide for that. But di diving in a little deeper, we talk about the initial state. Um, it's, that's the state of the device before you install or de uh, deploy anything to it. So it's basically out of the box. Um, <clears throat> your current state is the state of the device that exists at the last time it the time it was last reported. Uh, and this brings me to the Mac and Min corollary of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. Um, wrong Heisenberg. Uh, which is that uh, you can only know the state of the device uh, at the time it last reported. Uh, so you can never know the state of the actual device as it exists right now. Um, and Desired state is the state of your device that's compliant with your environment. And for many of us, that looks very, very different. Um, <clears throat> when I talk about frozen state, actually, we'll probably not talk about frozen state, but that's the uh, a, uh, state that doesn't uh, change at all or reverts. And the good example is that the kiosk or uh, something that's done with deep freeze. Um, and the ideal state, this is what we're all working for, towards, that uh, your current state, the current state of the device, should always match the desired state of the device. And an idempotent system, something that's state, stateful and state management, ensures that, but it doesn't preclude changes. And as Mac admins, you know, we all love changes. But, you know, as things in life, there is nothing permanent except change, as Heraclitus once said. Um, device states will change. Uh, software needs to be updated, new software needs to be installed, profiles need to be changed or pulled, settings need to be tweaked. Users customize and install extra software, software must be uninstalled at that point, devices become unmanaged, devices need to be deployed. A continuous, relentless cycle of changes threatening to overwhelm you. And here's Tom with the weather. So managing those changes then becomes very important. So in a, any system that you do, you will need to decide and define when changes that happen. Does this particular jaw need to change? Why does it need to change? How do you want to change it? When do you want to change it? <clears throat> And a state, stateful management system will also help you verify those changes. How do you implement the changes? How do you track those changes? What is success or failure for your organization in making those changes? And who is responsible for the changes when or if something goes wrong? Or when something goes right? Um, and for, at least for me, the idea of a state management system is the way to lazy admin nirvana. Um, I, by nature, am a very lazy person. I don't want to do a lot of work all the time. And um, it's worth it to me to work in a way that gives me more control and gives me uh, lots of automation and also being able to report on everything in my environment. But I don't want to be, I don't want to do anything in Excel. Uh, I don't want to touch Excel ever. Um, you know, I don't want to be running reports forever. And having these systems in place <laughs> helps you with that. So when we talk about control, we're talking about ensuring compliance with your environment. Um, you're talking about managing your changes and managing who's responsible for those changes. And it's usually me, but you know, it may be more than one person depending on the size of your organization. And uh, when you talk about automation, you know, that's the whole point of uh, doing more with less. And that gives us that idempotency, potency, that repeatable results every time we do a certain thing. Or, or, uh, and it also improves the quality of life. Because like one day, I want to get to the point where I go into work and I can look at cat videos on the internet all day and argue with people on the internet. So. And reporting, 
Um, knowing your environment means you can answer questions about your environment, because management always has questions about things. And if they might want to make a change, they need to know the state, and you need to know the state of your environment at all times. And <clears throat> so you can answer questions, and that gives you justification for, like, this is all the things that I'm doing. Can I get some help? Uh, and management likes to see reports, uh, and they, they do like to see the pretty graphs, because they're all busy, they're always in meetings, and always talking about things. And uh, your you know, seven-page you know, essay on why, uh, <laughs> why uh, you know, this version of Adobe Flash doesn't work with these specific machines doesn't really fly in those situations. So, you just hand them the graph, the chart, and they look at it in advance, and they can say, oh, yes, yeah, this is probably, we should probably change this. So reporting is very important in that sense. Um, so when we talk about state management systems, uh, this is how it's typically done. So this is uh, the XServes, which I loved because they looked gorgeous in the rack. Um, and the your desired state in a state management system exists as a text file. It's usually a flavor of JSON or XML. And it's hosted on the server somewhere. And uh, when to, you, um, <coughs> yes, it lives in a repo usually. Uh, that repo is usually some sort of GitHub repo, or it can be Bitbucket or whatever you have in there. And uh, when you go, and want to make changes to this, uh, this uh, your desired state, like um, <laughs> you want to commit any changes whatsoever, you commit it to that file in the repo. And for our purposes here, we're adding Google Chrome to whatever uh, desired state we have here. And then we commit those changes to the file and push those changes up. And then from there, the clients make the changes to match. So uh, this is a really, really basic overview of how that works. Um, uh, there is a lot of very detailed and very technical implementations of how that all, that I'm just glossing over very, very, very uh, much. Um, but this whole idea of infrastructure of code comes from that. The idea that if you make changes, your infrastructure is essentially a giant repo. You make changes, you push them out, it gives you change control, gives you versioning, so in case something doesn't work out, you can go back. And that bulk of that work, the burden of maintaining the state itself is on the client. Um, <laughs> And uh, there are some players in the space, obviously. If you we talk about state management, configuration management, you may know some of these. Um, there's like Ansible. There is, uh, in the Ansible channel in the Mac and Min Slack, uh, there is that Ant system, which I think uses the git pull module. Uh, there's Chef, which some of you should know, or may know, or have heard of. Puppet is also one of those. Uh, the salt stack, which is relatively new to me, and salt in general is new to me, uh, but that's also another large player that sort of this embraces all this idea. And of course, there's Monkey. Um, and moving on from that, so we know what stage management is, and we know um, how it works, and what it does, and what it brings to the table. Uh, we talk now about how Apple and MDM uh, changes all that. Device enrollment changes all that. And the first we need to go over Apple's security posture. And Apple uh, has adopted a very user-driven security policy and saying that third-party actions should be approved, um, which means that they're making no distinction for intent. Uh, by that, I mean the things that we want to do as admins to our devices because we are uh, expected to control and and um, secure them uh, is basically no different from what malicious actors and malware want to do. Because they also want to control those devices. And, um, and 
Apple has provided us an exception mechanism for us to do some, most of these things, and that exception mechanism is their MDM. And so we get things like UAMDM supervised mode, uh, user approved kernel extension loading, uh, the new user privacy stuff in macOS Mojave, and I'm not going to say the, the official name because you know, I'm nervous and I may stumble over it. Uh, and essentially what now is, is that MDM, having an MDM is now mandatory if you want to manage Apple devices. But privacy preferences policy control, um, as we know, has come in Mojave. Um, there's lots of things, lots of changes that Apple has made that we now have to develop ways of uh, overcoming, essentially. Uh, user data is now, in certain directories, is now protected. Apple events and inter-app exchanges and communication is now protected. Admin tools that sub-process out to do simple things, that uh, is also protected. And, uh, uh, and, being, and the user being uh, forced to see lots and lots of these dialogues could result in a situation where, say, Skype presents dialogues that says it needs the camera and microphone, user says no. And all of a sudden, Skype doesn't work. And then you get the ticket saying, my Skype doesn't work. So, um, so it's important for us to manage that. The problem is, MDM is not an idempotent certainty. <laughs> so, I mean, it's, uh, it's a bit better than 60%. But um, Apple themselves has said that APNS, the backbone of MDM, uh, is a uh, best effort service, uh, which means that they're not guaranteeing that things arrive when you send them out. Um, and APNS as itself is also an external service, and there is a lack of, I would say, insight logging into the whole process, uh, at least a lack of easy logging and insight into that whole process that uh, makes our lives a little different. Um, if any of you know who Alistair Banks is, uh, he coined the term MDM as the UDP of management, and if you don't get it, uh, that's the joke. <laughs> so, um, diving in a little bit, so when I say uh, best effort service, so uh, AP APNS, uh, device enrollment, Apple Business Manager, Apple School Manager, VPP, uh, all that activation stuff. Uh, that all has been uh, very detailed extensively. Uh, Brad Chapman spoke here last year, gave a wonderful talk about APNS and how it all works. And I encourage you to go back into the archives and look at that if you're at all curious about that. Um, but the big takeaway is that notification, the actual notifications through APNS, the delivery is not guaranteed. And by definition, that's not out of point. So, and when we talk about it being an external service, um, we are relying on something that exists outside of our network. Uh, the entire APNS system, the network, is owned by Apple. Uh, the whole device enrollment, parts of that require third-party support. Your vendors need to enter in serial numbers so you can actually use the device enrollment services. Uh, Apple has also introduced Secure Boot with uh, their new Macs, which means that you can only do device enrollment for certain machines. And uh, there's also locations still across the world where this device enrollment is not available yet. And on compounding that, there is also a certain lack of communication around changes, and there's very little documentation around some of these changes. Um, you know, and uh, as we saw with the, um, the privacy, the user privacy stuff coming in Mojave, um, there's a short testing window for all these changes for both uh, us as admins and for the vendors to implement these changes. And so we end up with implementations that maybe are not been fully vetted or fully tested for most edge use cases. 
So, and then on top of that, well, there is a certain amount of uh, lack of tools that come with that, that we can actually use to try and solve some of these issues. And, there's, and what tools we do have, there's like very little documentation. As an example, this is the entire man page for their MDM client. So. <clears throat> So, and trying to find out what goes wrong is not trivial. Um, there are tools that do exist to help you find out, but it's not something that it's, you have to invest time and effort in order to figure out what's going wrong. Uh, and there's a certain amount of that that's expected of us, but um, it, there's a lot more to be done in this than you would in sort of like the normal course of operations. And as a result, a lot of MDM vendors and some third parties end up filling in the gaps. Um, if you go to Google and do troubleshooting MDM, uh, the first hit you get is from uh, MicroMDM and our friends uh, Jesse and Victor. Um, and their, their top is about all troubleshooting because they have gone and in written and provided back to us you know, steps you can do to try and troubleshoot your MDM stuff. And uh, if you can see all that stuff down, you know, like three or four down, Microsoft has pages dedicated to how to troubleshoot their MDM. And if, you know, you notice, there's nothing showing up in the top hits that comes from Apple, so which is problematic. Um, diving in a little deeper and to talk about the actual mechanism, management mechanism that Apple gives us configuration profiles, um, those two have issues as far as item potency goes. Um, configuration files, some uh, settings can be overwritten. Uh, the one example that always comes to mind is the one uh, my friend Jeremy likes to refer to, and that is the, um, <coughs> the gatekeeper settings. If you set a, the gatekeeper settings through a configuration profile, someone with admin rights can do the command line, I think it's SCUtil or SPUtil uh, and overwrite them. And the configuration profile, the settings you push down, uh, doesn't revert and doesn't validate. And uh, he filed a radar for that, and Apple closed it, said working as intended. Uh, the other thing is that some profiles, when uh, you deploy them, only do the thing at install time. Uh, which means you can't pre-deploy those things. Good example is the uh, user-approved kernel extension loading. If you try to install a UAKL profile on a Sierra machine, A, Sierra has no idea what you just put on it, and when you go to upgrade that to High Sierra, um, because the profile is already there, it actually doesn't take an effect because it only works when it's pushed down initially. So you can't, you can't pre-approve uh, kernel extensions in that situation. And a lot of the configuration profiles you push down are not actively validating their, the state. So the things you want to manage, it's not actually being uh, enforced in some situations. There are obvious exceptions, like when you're talking about certain preferences, those are enforced. But other things that you set via configuration profiles aren't actively made, validated. Uh, an example would be AD binding. If you push it down by uh, configuration profile, it joins. But as we all know, Macs don't like to be bound to AD, and will, the AD binding will break at some point. Um, and the, having the profile on there doesn't remediate. So you have to pull the profile and re-push it back down in order to get that back into a working state. <clears throat> so. When we're talking about the state management systems before, things like Puppet, Ansible, uh, Chef, uh, Monkey, all those systems lack an MDM. Uh, uh, and they were usually doing configuration profiles, dynamically generating configuration profiles, installing them via the profiles command or via package. Um, but you couldn't do things like user-approved MDM because there was no MDM portion for that, and so like no whitelisting. <laughs> and um, so a lot of that stuff 
there are all the people who have in, who've been used to managing Macs without MDM are now looking to add MDM to their things, but m making it part of their workflow. So there's lots of organizations that have added MDM. So they can do UA MDM, UA Cal, and now the privacy stuff, and continue to manage their, the rest of their fleet the way they had been before. Um, and talking about it from a Jamf Pro perspective, where it includes the MDM, uh, it's, uh, <coughs> the Jamf Pro wasn't originally designed with this sort of state management in mind. Um, but those concepts are not mutually exclusive. And when we talk about that, there's things that us, we as Jamf admins can do to go and make things as stateful as possible. And there's a couple of ways we can go around doing that. Uh, like the simplest thing is making EAs and smart groups that work on sort of a binary uh, process uh, where, like, say, Adobe Flash is installed or not. So you scope your smart group to, like, say, Adobe Flash is installed, and your policy is then to uninstall it, and so you target that group. Um, but your desired state doesn't really exist as a concept in the Jamf Pro, so you basically have to do a couple of things around it. It's possible to do sort of like that desired state management that I've been talking about through that, but it, um, it adds a lot of complexity to your system and requires additional engineering. So the Jam Pro itself it does a lot of server-side processing. Everything happens on the server, whereas in the state management configuration management system, everything happens mostly client-side, and the server just hosts that desired state. Um, so moving towards that, how you would approach that, you would uh, make the clients do more of the work because you have, you know, depending on the size of your fleet, you have more machines able to do that processing than you do on the server side. Um, you, and lots of the things that we like to do with the Jamf Pro, we probably want to reduce some things because, it, especially as your fleet scales up, um, that's a lot of traffic coming to your servers. So the less work we can put, do on the server side and the more work we can do on the client side, the better. So things like varying the frequency of when the machines check in, passive over active EAs, and this was something that was very popular a couple of years, years ago because essentially EAs are scripts still running. Uh, so people were doing things during the EAs, but once you get to a certain size, that's a bad idea because that's a lot of work happening. Uh, and you just simplify your smart group criteria so it's not a lot to calculate. You know, as I said, binary, true or false, yes or no. Um, the other thing that uh, you can do is, if you're like me and is essentially lazy, you go looking out for somebody who's already done the thing you want to do and just steal it from them. <laughs> hmm. You may need to modify it if, if necessary, and as a last resort, you write your own. So, uh, and when I was thinking about this presentation and talking to you, and you know, going back and, and how everybody's like showing either new things or code, and I tried to do all that stuff. But I, I gave that up mainly for this because um, every Jamf instance, every organization is different, and what may work for me may not work for you. But sort of a general idea, sort of an experiment, this is sort of what I was thinking a state management in the Jamf Pro may look like. And it would start with a launch daemon that calls an app or script. You'd have your desired state as a file that exists on a server somewhere. And your app or script would then read that state and verify locally, make the computer uh, check to see everything is where you want it to be. And then sets a, on locally on the computer values and f for EAs to read, and then does a recon. And then your recon reads those values and then your smart group calculations are made, and then your policies were run at the next check-in. And then you, whenever you decide a thing needs to happen, you can set it so it happens at that often. And so the big pros about this is that it scales really well. The cons is that essentially you're re reinventing the wheel. So if you're going out to doing all that effort, there's things already out there existing that do this already and probably do it better than you would have uh, 
than you would, period. Because you're usually just one person and these things have been bitten by huge teams. So the other thing I thought about is like, what if we simplified it a little? So, we, uh, so instead of having a hosted desired state file, we make sort of a local desired state file. And most of the stuff usually applies, the same as the other thing, and that's less setup, but it doesn't really scale as well. And then you're also, and it's also fraught with the same sort of uh, problems that anything that we do locally on the computer can, um, yeah, can be subject to. Um, you know, so if a state, so if a computer doesn't check in for a while, that local state file never gets updated, and so things don't change, and so you have other problems. So, uh, so at that point, um, you're left with a couple of other options. Uh, for those of you who have Azure AD, conditional ac access will actually help you with that stateful system, because now you have an entire different system that's helping you verify the state of your machine. And the other option, probably the easiest option, relatively speaking, is to try and integrate one of these other state management, configuration management systems in with your Jamf Pro. Um, and that's, you know, the, the amount of work is varied depending on which system you choose, but we've had examples of that. Uh, like our friend Ben does a Jam Jar, which essentially integrates Monkey with Jamf. And so they have a much more stateful system than comes currently. Uh, the other thing is file of, um, feature requests, and it's not listed here, but also uh, radars, enterprise cases, and you know whatever you have with, to connect with Apple about things, about the, some of the stuff you see, um, like the lack of tools, and you know this whole not configurations, not actively validating or enforcing things. Um, those should all be radars. And uh, if you see similar things that are out there, like similar feature requests or similar radars, don't be afraid to dupe any of that stuff, especially the radars, because the more dupes that they have to close, the more awareness it creates on Apple's side that this is a thing that needs to be addressed. I'm not saying they will, but they'll at least be aware of it. And that's... Pretty much all I have to say, the one takeaway you want, want from this is that everybody wa I want everybody to basically be thinking about what they can do to <coughs> make a stateful Jamf Pro uh, and how they can uh, implement that in their organization and in their environment. Um, <coughs> so just a few closing things. Uh, you know, if you're ever in the Philadelphia area, please let me know and we'll host you at the at our Philly Mac and Men's meetup, or just go out for a beer or whatever. Um, Joel can attest to, the, to that. Um, <clears throat> and of course, you know, we're in Minnesota. I'm from Philly. So, you know, Philly, Philly. <clears throat> and uh, speaking of our Philadelphia Mac and Men's, uh, John Malman, who's another one of the Philadelphia Mac and Men's, who uh, helps me with the group, uh, his talk is. Um, uh, coming later this week, uh, he's going to be talking about Jamf Notify, Depth Notify, and the Jamf Pro, and he's Thursday at 9 a.m. at the right here, actually. So come check him out because you know I know he's here somewhere, watching me. So you should all be coming here for him as well. And so thank you for coming to my TED talk. Uh, I'd also like to thank my wife, the Donna, uh, who hates it when I go away to these things because it means she has to take public transportation. Um, I'd like to thank everybody who's on the Mac Admins Twitter and Slack, all the Jamf folks, and all the Comcast folks who reluctantly let me be here, and, um, and anybody else who has ever helped me or I have helped them, thank you very much. So, what questions do you have for me? Anybody? No questions, really? Yeah, right okay. Uh, you mentioned that there were some things available uh, to do state management with Jamf, but you didn't mention any particular names. Do you have some names that you could give us? Um, names of? Of like open source apps or oh, um, things like that. So things that helps you with state management, um, in particular, um, 
So I know Eric Gomez has written a lot of tools around MDM and trying to pop notifications. Um, yeah, the one thing he did, he wrote is UMed, which helps with you know getting people to enroll and to do the user approved MDM. That's one thing. There's there's really a lot out there depending on what you need to do. So it's um, that's one thing. I mean GitHub is a big repository. If you go into Mac and Slack channel and basically say this is what I want to do. Most times, like nine times out of ten, somebody will say, hey, check out this project. Um, things like Eric Berglund's Profile Creator, which basically um, gives you a way to make configuration profiles uh, that's outside of the JAMP process, um, but it allows you to do it in a uh, very uh, bespoke way. So you're just managing what you just want to manage and without anything else in between there. Um, and there's a few other tools like that. Um, it all depends on what you need. So uh, if you have anything specific, find me afterwards, and I can probably uh, answer Thank that. Thank you. Yep. Hi. Hi, Graham Pugh. Um, yeah, I think it's important that we really push Jamf to improve the state management stuff yes. rather than really give up and use other tools. Right. Um, well, it's, it's, it's a two-pronged effort, I, I think. It's um, both Jamf to help us give us the, the tools that we need, and also on Apple to actually help, you know, we tell Apple what we need to be able to do, because we are relying on not just on one vendor, but two at the, in this point in order to manage our fleets. And so it's important that they also hear that as well. Yeah. So. Yeah. I mean, I've, I'm trying to do state management just with Jamf. Um, and so I have hundreds of smart groups and, and right. policies to achieve this. And uh, yeah, it, we need to uh, speak to Jam to see if we can make it. Yes, yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, that's very important. You, you like feature requests for Jam for things like, and they're listening. I mean, we finally have, as they announced at the keynote, they have, we have uh, install application yeah. and install enterprise application. That's now a thing. Um, hopefully, eventually, some more of the MDM inventory stuff will come uh, for Max as it is on the iOS side on the, on the, through Jamf, so we can leverage those tools as well. So. One last thing, if we can look for the feature requests where we can get configuration profiles um, discrete, split into discrete um, uh, settings um, so that, for instance, the new one for privacy preferences mm -hmm. Um, is bundled in with security and privacy, which means if you set anything in there, right. you're going to enforce file vault or not, or and so on. We need to make that discrete. And right. Again, you know, since we are, vote that. You know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and again, that that's incumbent upon us to tell Jamf and to tell Ample, this is what we need. Please make this happen. So, but yes, I totally agree. Anyone else? Nobody wants to ask me about my jacket. It's <laughs> impressive. So. All right. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much.